Oh, so yeah, let's talk about the neural rendering, the volume rendering for today. So I guess many of you uh, have seen this kind of video. Uh, so this is kind of the demo from the Nerve Studio, uh, which is basically making some kind of the, some, you know, AR kind of the applications uh, with some kind of 3D reconstruction. So what you are basically seeing in this video, so can everyone see the video? Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm not sure whether there might be some kind of a latency uh, in the Zoom session. Uh, but basically, this is kind of some sort of the demo, the AR demo, uh, based on some kind of the 3D reconstruction. Uh, so what? Let me if I just play this again. Uh, so this is case that we are basically reconstructing some real scene, uh, making it as kind of some virtual scene, and then basically augmenting the scene with some kind of the, some uh, the characters here, and making some nice video by compositing some real the scene images and also some virtual kind of the objects here. Uh, so there can be also many other applications in terms of like, you know, uh, doing some kind of the reconstruction with 3D scene and making some kind of the, some nice, uh, this kind of the demo. So what actually we are going to discuss for today is slightly uh, different kind of the perspective in terms of the, like, what we typically discuss in the computer graphics is more about basically how we make some kind of the 2D images from the, some virtual 3D, things, right? So that's basically what we all discuss in the uh, 380, the introduction to computer practice course and also this course as well. So we assume that uh, we are having some kind of the virtual the 3D environment uh, where we are basically defining some kind of some also uh, some virtual the objects and virtual some kind of light sources and some metal properties, like all those kind of things. And we do some kind of the, some physical sort of the simple simulation uh, in terms of basically projecting the, some 3D things into this the 2D plane. So that's basically how we get the 2D image from the 3D. But kind of the perspective for the 3D, especially from the computer, the vision, the, the aspect, is more about basically how we you know, reconstruct 3D uh, from some kind of the observation of some kind of real scenes uh, into some kind of the 2D images. So what we can also think about is that when you have some kind of the collection of the 2D images that are basically captured uh, from different viewpoints in the real scene, here the question is basically how we are going to actually uh, reconstruct the 3D uh, from the observation of the real scenes from the 2D. So you can see that this is kind of like quite opposite direction. So graphics, uh, the focus is more about basically 3D, 2D, 2D, uh, like basically 2D rendering. Uh, but the vision perspective might be about like 3D reconstruction from the 2D, 2D to 3D. So what we are going to discuss for today is basically slightly more about the division, the perspective in terms of like how we do some 3D reconstruction from the 2D, uh, but you can also see that actually this kind of the 2D to 3D uh, reconstruction is also quite related uh, to the rendering the process to 3D to the 2D. So we are going to see how these kind of the two uh, different the perspectives can be basically interweaved uh, with some kind of the rendering the pipeline. And especially like what we are going to discuss for today is more about not exactly about the 3D reconstruction, but the actually the ultimate goal was more about basically Nobel view synthesis. Uh, so what we basically mean with the Nobel view synthesis is that uh, we are assuming that having some kind of a collection of the 2D images that are basically captured from the different the camera the viewpoints. And then what we want to do is basically actually synthesizing a image from the you know different view. So basically given a collection of the 2D images how we get a image from the new, the, the novel view uh, is actually exactly the, the problem that we want to solve uh, using some kind of a typical the neural rendering the pipeline. So one example is this. Uh, so this is also from the, the NERP uh, the paper. So as you can see, the left-hand side is basically showing the kind of the images that we are having, that we, we capture from the real scenes. So given this kind of some discrete examples of the 2D images, how we can make some kind of the, you know, all the images from the, uh, the RB3D views in terms of like, then we can make some kind of the very smooth, uh, the trajectory, some motion of the, the camera, uh, and then making some kind of video like this. So this is more of basically the Nobel view synthesis. So that was kind of the, uh, the goal for the, you know, uh, original the goal of the, the neural rendering. So basically here, the focus is more about basically not doing some kind of reconstruction for this 3D, but it's more about basically synthesizing some kind of the novel view the images. And also here, the assumption is that we only have the images as kind of the given data. Uh, so we don't have any kind of the supervision, any kind of the information about the 3D uh, that we can learn, but we, we only have the information for the, the 2D. So in these kind of the cases, when we do not have any kind of information for this 3D, how we can do some kind of the, some, you know, uh, the synthesis of the images from the novel view. Uh, this is kind of the basic idea. 
And also what we are going to see uh, in the null pipeline, especially in the, the machine learning the perspective is that obviously this is not a machine learning the course, but so we are not gonna uh, discuss you know, like all this kind of the, the perspective here. Uh, but the, here the main key thing is that uh, if we think about like making some sort of the ML the system, so let's say we are having making some kind of the neural net uh, that is taking some kind of the, a set of the 2D images as kind of training data, and given some kind of a new the camera pose, uh, we want to basically make some kind of a new image. Then actually we can think about some sort of the black box the neural net, right? So the black box the neural net is basically, yeah, let me actually go to the next slide first. Uh, so we can think about some sort of the black box the neural net, uh, which is taking the camera matrix as the input uh, in the kind of the, the inference time, and the output becomes some sort of the 2D image, right? Uh, so we can think about making this kind of the, some black box system. And this network uh, can be uh, trained in a kind of supervised way. So we assume that for some of the samples of the camera the matrices, uh, we are having the you know, ground towards the 2D images. Then we can train this kind of neural net uh, using some kind of loss function. So the simplest loss function might be just L to loss. Uh, we just compare the output, the rendered image, and the basically you know, given the ground towards image and just measure the color difference, the L to loss, and basically doing some kind of back propagation. Uh, for the nerve, right? for the sorry, the neural network, right? But the kind of the interesting the aspect of the uh, the neural rendering is that uh, the goal is basically not to make some sort of the black box the decoder. And actually, if you just try to make this kind of some random the neural net that is basically taking the input and making three things some kind of prediction for the output, actually you will see that it's quite challenging uh, to make some kind of the working the neural net. Uh, it's really kind of the challenge in the problem. Uh, but here, the kind of the goal in the machine learning the perspective is that actually we want to make some kind of the more interpretable, some kind of the image decoder, uh, which is not just like decoding the image using some kind of the conversion neural network the transformer, but actually making the image as kind of using the rendering the process uh, from the 3D representation. So here the goal again like it comes like coming back to the 3D again. Like so making some sort of the 3D in terms of that we can produce the image uh, using some kind of the rendering the pipeline. Uh, so this is basically the basic goal uh, in the neural rendering kind of the framework. Uh, I mean, so there is no any kind of the, as far as I know, any like you know, specific like exact the definition of the neural rendering. Uh, but in my understanding, the neural rendering would be this kind of the cases. We want to basically uh, make some kind of the image decoder, uh, which is basically produced not using some kind of the black box decoder, but using some kind of the rendering the process, uh, which is like you know, starting from the 3D representation. So this is kind of a quite interesting the perspective, I think, in terms of that, you know, actually when he leverage some kind of the more interpretable, uh, some kind of system uh, producing the 2D images. And especially when you utilize the rendering equation that we have been uh, using uh, in the many kind of the graphics the pipeline actually performs way better than making some kind of the black box the neural net the, the decoder. So how can you also make this kind of the system uh, utilize this kind of like rendering equation in the decoding process uh, is kind of the key aspect in the neural rendering. So this is a quite different that you know, we are seeing in the many kind of the uh, the machine learning kind of the framework. So in many of the cases, we are making some sort of the, uh, you know, uh, some giant the architecture that somehow decodes something uh, in a way that, that we cannot understand, right? Uh, but this is really a case that we are decoding the images uh, in a way that we you know, can really understand. I mean, the kind of exactly the rendering the pipeline that we have seen uh, in the graphics the framework. So this is kind of the uh, the perspective here. And also basically what we are going to do is that you know, we are making the system that is taking the camera matrix as the input and making the 2D images that, as, as the output. So as I said, like on how we are going to basically generate the 2D images. So what we are going to do is that actually we are going to, uh, going back to the kind of the graphics kind of pipeline, we are going to do some kind of the 3D construction first and then render this into the 2D image. So that's basically the way that we are uh, Reverse some kind of the physical properties for the 2D image generation. And then the question becomes about, you know, how are we going to basically do some kind of the 3D generation or 3D reconstruction? Uh, so this was also kind of the, the big problem uh, some years ago, uh, we, especially in the kind of the some vision graphics area. Uh, and there are some basically many attempts in terms of how we're going to do some kind of the 3D reconstruction. So as we also have discussed in this course, like the you know, mesh is the kind of the most, the common representation uh, for the 3D, right? So there are basically some kind of the papers like this. So I'm not sure how many of you uh, know this work. Uh, this is the work that was quite 
famous at that time, pixel to mesh, uh, which is basically uh, taking a image as the input and making some 3D as kind of output like this. So this was kind of like one of the examples that we are doing some kind of the 2D to 3D construction using the neural net. And here the basic idea is that we are starting from some kind of the template the mesh, uh, which is the ellipsoid mesh in this case, uh, on the left-hand side here. And then doing some kind of the, some you know, iterative the deformation uh, in a way that the final the mesh can be you know, aligned uh, with the input image like this. So we assume that we are having some kind of the mask of the, some kind of the foreground region in the 2D image. And we can either even have some kind of the multiple images from the different views. Uh, for those kind of cases, like we are somehow doing some kind of the creative the deformation for the 3D mesh uh, in a way that the output the mesh can be aligned with the silhouette uh, of the, the foreground region for the images. So this was kind of the, some very sort of the early attempt uh, doing some kind of the 2D to 3D construction. But obviously there are some kind of the many limitations in this system. So what would be kind of some limitations for this system? Any guess? Well, basically the system is not just like learning for a single image. So we are also trained in your net for the multiple images and the multiple objects. Yeah, so there are many good answers. I mean, obviously the topology might be one thing. So as we are basically starting from some kind of ellipsoid mesh, uh, unless we do some kind of the, you know, uh, some tearing or some kind of the, some sort of the doing some surgery, you know, like cutting some part of the mesh or something, uh, it is hard to basically change the topology of the shape. Uh, so that is kind of like the one of the big the problem. And obviously the other thing is that you know, for some kind of the unseen region, uh, there is no way. I mean, for the unseen region, uh, it should be more about basically uh, learning some kind of the generated the models. So it's basically it's checking all the kind of the, the possibilities uh, for the some unseen the regions. And also this is not really basically predict some kind of the color information, but that can be actually done uh, by adding some kind of the additional the neural network. Or yeah, so there are many kind of such issues in terms of like also describing some more the details uh, for some kind of part of the shapes, as you can see, uh, so for some kind of thin parts of the shape, how are we going to basically represent those kind of things with, by just like deforming some of the ellipsoid mesh? Uh, so this really also kind of ch the challenging the problems. So actually there are some kind of, uh, some lots of the limitations for this line of the work. So I also did not prepare these slides for many other the examples doing some kind of the 2D to 3D uh, the reconstruction. Uh, but also there are some kind of the cases that, you know, uh, generating the, some kind of the meshes by literally basically, you know, creating a sequence of the vertices and connecting all these vertices into, uh, to make some kind of the faces, the, the triangles as well. And this is also quite sort of the fragile the system in terms of that uh, we can make some kind of the last of the invariably the meshes, uh, making some kind of random connections of the vertices and making some very wrong the faces. So actually uh, making a mesh as the output is really you know, challenging the task. Uh, while there have been the lots of the attempts, uh, we actually we have seen that like uh, the direct generation of the meshes uh, were not basically performing well. So actually one of the reasons that we are also seeing some kind of the bad output for those kind of the, the cases uh, is because of the slow the convergence uh, in the learning uh, in terms of that. Uh, so basically we're gonna compare the output the mesh uh, with the kind of give, given the input the image or some kind of the mask. Uh, so the process of like aligning these two uh, might be actually using the ray casting the system. Like we are shooting the ray uh, from the 2D image and basically finding the intersection point with the 3D and then doing some kind of the comparison between the 3D and the 2D. Uh, so for those kind of the cases, uh, what we can see is that we are only basically updating the one single point per pixel, uh, which is basically the first intersection point. Uh, which means that like for every single pixel, we are basically 
uh, doing some kind of the update for a single point over the 3D mesh. Uh, and that is basically you know, making some kind of a very slow the process of like updating all the things. So here also the question is that how we can do some kind of the, uh, make some kind of faster the convergence uh, in this kind of the, the learning the process. So this was also kind of the, some concerns uh, in this direction. And also what people have basically seen, uh, you know, the recent kind of the work, uh, actually you know, five years ago, uh, was basically the, the fact that you know, it's also uh, good to util utilize some kind of the implicit functions instead of the mesh. So the idea for the implicit function, uh, which is also representations, basically which are also utilized in the many other the graphics, the pipeline as well, uh, is basically having some kind of representing this 3D, some kind of the shape as kind of function. So when you basically pick any kind of the point uh, in the 2D or the 3D space, uh, we, either we are basically having some information about the occupancy, uh, whether the point is inside or the outside of the shape, or we can uh, take some kind of assigned distance information, uh, which is basically the sign, basically the distance information, and plus some kind of the, the occupancy as well, like just you know, uh, indicating the inside and outside as kind of a sign. So the good thing of like having this kind of the you know implicit representation is that you know it's much more some sort of the flexible the representation that you know as we're gonna see also in the NERC the pipeline and you know it's also uh good for basically describing some more the details and uh, without having any restriction for the topology as well. So this was kind of the uh many kind of the advantages that we could see uh for the implicit the functions. So actually, if we see some kind of literature in terms of like you know, how the 3D generation or the reconstruction, the, the neural networks uh, have been basically developed, uh, we can see that actually the implicit function was kind of the uh, one of the, the best of the choices in terms of like getting some kind of the accurate uh, this 3D shape. But also here, the problem is that uh, once we basically reconstruct some 3D things uh, into some kind of the implicit representation, uh, if we want to compare this output with the given the 2D images, that we also need to involve some kind of the, some rendering the pipeline uh, for the comparison between the 2D and the 3D, right? Then here the question is that how we can basically render such kind of the implicit representation. So for example, if we have a basically designed the distance the function, uh, then how we can render this the, the assigned distance function into the 2D image. So this is kind of also the one big, big problem. So what we can basically uh, do uh, for this kind of rendering of the implicit function uh, is this kind of spear tracing. Uh, so which has been uh, you know, introduced in the 1995, uh, like almost like 30 years ago, uh, and which is really kind of the popular the idea uh, for the rendering of the implicit function. So here the basic idea is that you know, if we have a kind of the signed uh, distance the function, uh, then what we can say is that you know, at this point, let's say we are starting it from this point, right? So from this point, uh, you know, what we mean by basically having the signed uh, implicit function is that uh, for any point in the space, we can get the information about the, uh, the distance to the closest point, right? So that's the basically the, the, the meaning of the, the distance, right? So for each of the point, uh, we basically query uh, the point with, in terms of like, you know, uh, retrieving the distance information. And the distance basically indicates that you know, uh, there is no obstacle uh, in the sphere, uh, which is defined with the radius of that distance, right? Uh, does it make sense? So if we start from this kind of the point, uh, if we get the kind of the distance information, and if we draw this kind of the sphere in the 3D space, then there should be no obstacle uh, inside the sphere, uh, because you know, the closest the point over the surface should be basically having this kind of the distance, right? So we can basically, uh, along the specific direction, we can proceed. Uh, we can march along the ray uh, with the amount of the distance that we basically retrieve at this point. And we can just like, you know, repeat this process. So once we basically march along the ray, uh, amount of like this distance, then from this point, uh, we again basically, you know, getting the distance information, uh, which means that if we also draw this pier, uh, there should be basically no kind of the points that we are making the intersection. Then we proceed again. So we can basically do this kind of the iteration until we basically really reach to some kind of the, uh, the intersection point. So this was basically the very you know, simple but very effective the idea in terms of like rendering uh, with the implicit function. But obviously like, you know, this kind of pure tracing the idea also has lots of the limitations as well. So what are the kind of the limitations of this pure tracing? Uh, especially like running some kind of the some 3D reconstruction or the generation in the neural net the pipeline. So 
So think about the, the framework. Basically, we are doing some sort of the 2D to 3D, the, you know, some generation or the reconstruction. Uh, then we, once we basically make some kind of the you know, predict, some kind of the 3D shape uh, represented as kind of the implicit function, then we're gonna basically render this 3D thing into the 2D images and do some kind of a comparison with the 2D images, right? And the back propagation with the, the some kind of loss, uh, you know, uh, measuring the difference between the 2D and the rendered 3D, uh, will basically affect uh, the implicit function, basically updating the given the implicit function. Uh, so for this kind of system, uh, if we use this kind of spear tracing as kind of the, the rendering the pipeline, uh, what would be kind of challenges for that? Yeah, so as you can basically expect to see, I mean, you know, uh, this kind of framework is not that differentiable, right? So there might be, it's basically involving lots of kind of the, you know, non-differentiable kind of the, the steps. And obviously there are some kind of attempts to make some kind of the differentiable, the, you know, spirit tracing kind of the pipeline. Uh, she's kind of like making some kind of modification, but still with this kind of some differentiable the spirit tracing kind of the idea, uh, the problem is that it's quite, you know, computationally heavy because like it involves kind of the multiple iterations. So this is kind of the, some of the kind of examples that actually we can have lots of kind of these uh, steps to reach to this first intersection point. So if we, especially when you have some kind of the objects that becomes you know, closer to the, the rate that we are shooting, uh, then that will basically involve lots of kind of the sub iterations uh, because it makes the, uh, the size of this period to be small, right? So this is kind of like one example. Like also this is kind of the one sort of the corner case. Like if we are actually shooting a ray, uh, which you know, does not hit any point in this 3D space, uh, but still there can be some kind of the lots of the iterations. So you know, we wanna actually see that, you know, we are having all these small spheres uh, along the ray. And after like all the iterations, okay, we, we realize that actually this is the ray, uh, which is not hitting any kind of point uh, over the, you know, in the, the 3D the surface. So you can see that actually this is like can uh, involve lots of some kind of the heavy computation, uh, which is also not that helpful to basically train such kind of neural net. So these are all the kind of the issues, and these these are actually really something that people have tried uh, to do some kind of the two D to three D the reconstruction, and there are lots of such kind of issues. And interestingly, uh, the solution that people found uh, was actually breaking some kind of the physical rules. So what actually we typically want to reconstruct uh, is some kind of the, some solid the object. So we are basically some sort of the, some object that are represented with some plastic, all those kind of things. So it's not just kind of the volume, but we know that there should be some kind of the intersection uh, over the surface of the objects. And that's what we also do uh, in our basically some ray tracing system in many kind of the graphics the pipeline. But for this kind of like 2D, 2D, 3D reconstruction, what people found is that actually Sometimes for in terms like efficiency of like training this kind of neural net, uh, it's better to break the physical rules uh, in terms of the, you know, we are seeing all these rate objects as kind of some sort of the volume. So now we are going to assume that the rate can basically you know, you know, pass through the objects. So basically penetrating all kind of the surface and the rate can basically go inside uh, the objects and passing through the, the objects. And by having this kind of the, the assumption that you know, we are now seeing some kind of some solid objects, but having some kind of the volume, uh, we can basically utilize all these kind of the some uh, advantages. So like having the implicit the representation uh, without basically using some kind of peer tracing kind of some, you know, uh, computationally heavy, some rendering the pipeline, and also basically not, you know, just like finding the first intersection the point, uh, but basically, you know, uh, the some update with like one single array, uh, we will basically also update kind of the, uh, not just like single point, but the many parts of the 3D space. So there are actually in terms of like the efficiency of the trained neural net, uh, this kind of the volume representation uh, will give you some kind of lots of the advantages and also give some kind of the better the outputs. So this is kind of the basic idea for the recent uh, the neural rendering kind of pipeline. So before that, actually there was some kind of the many other attempts in terms of like using some different representation, but now some kind of the, you know, uh, the, the output that we are seeing is that uh, when you utilize some kind of the volume representation for the 3D, even when we reconstruct some, some sort of the solid, the object, 
actually we can get some kind of the much better the outputs. So that's the basic idea that we are utilizing some kind of the volume the rendering the ideas. And for that, basically we also need to render this kind of the, some 3D volume into the 2D images. And also the key thing is that you know, for this kind of the rendering of the volume, actually we can also utilize some kind of the uh, some classical the volume rendering the the equation, uh, which has been very you know extensively studied uh, in the the computer graphics literature uh, more than over like the thirty years. So the first paper, uh, which is doing some kind of the volume rendering, uh, was introduced in the nineteen eighty four, which is like thirty exactly thirty years ago. Uh, and so what we are going to do in the neural rendering pipeline is basically nothing but just you know, simply uh, utilize this kind of some very classical uh, the volume rendering the pipeline uh, in terms of like getting some kind of making some you know interpretable the image decoding the system. So this is kind of the the, the basic idea. And before we go you know, discuss some kind of the main idea for the NERF, uh, let's also see some kind of the relatively you know early early work. Uh, so the deep voxels uh, was kind of the some early early work uh, doing some kind of the novel view synthesis. So here basically the idea is that you know, we are uh, basically having some sort of the 3D the voxels, and also we are having some kind of the uh, and the number of the images uh, which are all the captured from the different the camera of the bodies. And here, basically, we, we assume that we are having the all the camera deposit information for the images. And the deep, in the deep voxels, basically, what we do is that uh, we are doing some kind of the hybrid of the neural encoding, decoding, and also the some classical, the some rendering kind of projection, the pipeline in the, the computer graphics. So this is kind of the diagram, uh, which is basically showing the 1D to 2D uh, the examples. But actually, but the same thing can be you know, uh, somehow imagined in the fully 2D to 3D. So in the kind of the encoding the process, uh, what we do is that uh, we are still encoding the two the images. So you can see that we are for the, the so let's say like now the image is kind of like one the things, and we are having some kind of kind of the convolution the neural net, uh, which is basically giving some kind of the feature vector per pixel. When what we do is that we shoot a ray uh, for each of the pixel, doing some kind of the ray testing, like shooting the all the rays to the you know uh, three D space. And then we propagate uh, the, the feature vectors for each of the pixel into the 3D space. So this is like you know, showing some kind of the, you know, uh, this kind of the, some propagation from the 2D pictures uh, into the 3D. And also what we can do is that if we have some kind of the multiple the images, even we can also accumulate uh, this kind of the 2D pictures in the 3D space. So it's kind of the hybrid things, right? So we are utilizing some neural encoding while also doing some kind of the typical the ray tracing. Uh, to basically spread out all the 2D information in this 3D space. And then the coding step is ex exactly the, the opposite. So now what we can do is that now we you know, uh, you know, project all this 3D information uh, into the 2D plane along the rays, uh, doing some kind of, kind of another the aggregation uh, of the, the, the features that are encoded in the 3D voxels uh, to basically put them into the, one to, into the, the pixel in the 2D image. And then we decode this feature back to the image. So this is exactly the opposite step, right? And you can see that also this is kind of some combination of the some uh, 3D to the 2D projection and also some kind of decoding. Make sense? But here, one more thing is that uh, for typical this kind of this, some rendering the pipeline, we also need to consider some sort of the occlusion, right? Uh, if we consider like there are some sort of the, some real the solid objects uh, in this 3D space, uh, some kind of the objects that are occluded occluded uh, by the other object should not be considered uh, in our the projection the, the pipeline. And to mimic this kind of some you know, occlusion kind of the, uh, the, the situations, uh, what we can also do is that they are basically also introducing some kind of the some uh, visibility the testing the neural network. So once you basically have all these kind of features that are you know stored uh, for each of the 3D the voxels, uh, for each the vector we also predict how likely this kind of the, the this voxel will be visible uh, for each of the ray. Uh, that is like giving some kind of the probability here. So as you can see here. Oops. For each of the 3D voxel, uh, for each of the, the along the ray, uh, we also get some kind of the probability, which is indicating how likely the voxel will be visible uh, from that ray. And then we are doing some kind of the, you know, uh, weighted sum of the features in terms of basically getting some kind of the doing some sort of the projection. 
So this is kind of the, some neural occlusion, the aware of some sort of the projection uh, using another the neural network, uh, which is giving some kind of the visibility the information. So very simple the idea, uh, but this was quite effective uh, in terms of doing some sort of the uh, Nobel view synthesis. So these are some of the examples. You can see that the right hand side here is basically the input the images, uh, given the set of the discrete set of the images, and then we are doing some kind of the interpolations of the views uh, by moving the, the camera. So you can see that the actual output looks quite good. So this was kind of the work uh, five years ago. And let me also show some one more video. Yeah, some of this video does not work, so let me just skip this. Uh, and yeah, and this is also kind of the comparison when you use the occlusion in your network or when you do not uh, use the, the occlusion in your network. As you can see, when you use this kind of like having some sort of the notion of the visibility, uh, we can you know get some kind of the more better the outputs. So actually, at the time, this was really kind of the uh, very impress the impressive the work in terms of that we can do the reconstruction for the all these kind of the tiny the details. We are seeing that all the letters, uh, especially when you use the occlusion digital network, we can get some more the precise uh, the outputs like this. So this was kind of the interesting example in terms of that we are still using the neural net, but doing some sort of the, you know, making some hybrid divergence in terms of like doing the encoding and the decoding, not only using the, you know, the neural network, but also using some kind of the 2D to 3D and also the 3D to 2D, some sort of the rendering the pipelines. And also we could see that like having some kind of the uh, notion of the occlusion, the visibility uh, was basically giving some kind of the better the outputs. But as you can see, like this kind of hybrid diversion is also making some sort of the issues. And can you also guess some kind of the limitations of like this framework? Yeah, so as you said, like one of the limitations would be basically high, there is quite memory the heavy system. Uh, so in terms of that, you know, uh, we, we, and this is also the case that we are somehow training all these kind of things for the single the object, right? Just to represent a single the object, uh, we will need basically some 3D voxel representation uh, while also storing some kind of the high dimensional the feature vector uh, for the voxel. Uh, so this will be also the case that we are you know, having some kind of the memory issue, uh, basically having taking lots of the memory just to represent a single the kind of the object. So you know also you know, you know uh, I mean this kind of some uh, issue also can be resolved when you start to use some kind of the implicit representation. So that's also what we are going to say in the NERF D framework. And also the another kind of thing is that while we are having some kind of the notion of the visibility, like having some kind of neural net, which is giving some kind of information about the, uh, the visibility, uh, actually this you know, occlusion, the aware the projection may not be physically the correct. So can you think about some of these situations that you know, the, the visibility, the testing the neural network might be giving some kind of the physically wrong information? This is the key part that we are going to discuss in the previous lecture. Yeah. 
you see the case that what you know that I mean is such kind of the cases. Like, let's say like we should be re, and we're gonna have some kind of the loss of some sort of the voxels uh in the 3D space. And let's say the visibility here is kind of like 0 0.1, which is quite low, right? But let's say like we have also having some kind of the points uh behind uh this voxel, which is having like 0 0.9. Does it make sense? So if we see that the visibility is like close to zero. Uh, which means that there is like the high chance that there is something uh, which is occluding this voxel, right? So if we are we cannot see this the voxel, which means that this was basically occluded by something else here, right? Which means that all the points along this ray should not have some kind of the high visibility. Make sense? So if we have some kind of the some visibility score here, like the 0 0.5 or something. Then all the points behind this point should have the 0 0.5 or less than 0 0.5 the visibility score. Otherwise, it does not make sense, basically. It is clear. So this is kind of key thing. Like when you talk about some kind of the some visibility uh, along the array uh, from this kind of viewpoint, if we have some kind of the uh, visibility score at this point, then all the points behind this point. Uh, should have like equal or less than uh, the visibility score, which is like equal to less than the, the score at this point. But the, this kind of the visibility, the testing, the neural network does not guarantee uh, this kind of the some, you know, which called the correctness uh, for the occlusion. It's, it's like giving some kind of the random score uh, for the visibility. So actually, physically, this is not really not making sense. I mean, there can be some kind of the many interesting the situations uh, that you know some kind of the closer the voxels is not visible, while the farther the voxels are more visible. So there is no such kind of like guarantee to uh, satisfy this kind of the occlusion the constraint. So that's why actually we are going to not just using some sort of the some random de encoding decoding kind of framework, uh, but you know, we're gonna see how we can incorporate some kind of the volume random equation in this case. And the NERF was kind of the famous work in terms of like uh, when he showing that actually when he uh, makes a more physically you know, correct kind of system for the rendering, it actually it performs way really, really better than making some kind of the, some neural random neural some kind of the framework. So when you see some kind of the differences uh, between the nerve and the deep voxels, it is that there are some multiple some sort of the major the differences here. So one key difference is that we are not going to use the voxels, but we are going to use the implicit representation, uh, which is basically giving some more the efficiency in terms of like consuming less amount of the memory. And it's also the resolution free. Uh, so we don't need to specify some specific resolution to all the 3D voxels, uh, but we can have some kind of the uh, resolution to the 3D outputs. So that's kind of the uh, one thing. And also the other thing is that we are not going to encode some kind of the latent pictures. So this is not about doing some kind of the some neural decoding of the things. Uh, we're going to really basically encode some kind of the physical property, uh, which is the density information and also the color information. But instead of like just having the color information, actually we're gonna have some sort of the view dependent the color information. So what's the kind of the view dependent color information in this case? See the in terms of the radiometry. What we mean by like the view dependent the colors? I mean, that's the radiance, right? Yeah, so we, we discussed how we exactly get the color information at the end in the uh, the ray tracing the system, right? And we discussed the spectral rendering the pipeline, but the simplified version would be basically like competing all the things uh, for each channel uh, of the RGB channel of the, the color, right? Uh, then the some kind of the view dependent color information actually here basically means some kind of the view dependent uh, this some kind of light information, uh, which is basically this some radiance information. So it's all about basically encoding the amount of the, the, the radiance, uh, which is basically emitted uh, from the volume, and also some kind of the density information. So which is really uh, storing some sort of the physical the quantities uh, instead of some sort of the random, some sort of the latent features that will be decoded uh, using some kind of the black box decoder. So this is like another the big difference. 
And the other kind of the, the, the kind of thing is that uh, we are not going to also use the neural net uh, for some kind of the visibility the test, uh, but we are going to use the, the volume rendering the equation that has been used in the compact graphics framework for the 30 years. Uh, so as you can see, uh, the, some of the major key changes from the deep pixels through the, the nerf uh, is basically making the system to be more physically uh, making more the sense. So that's kind of the, the main idea here. And these are some of the some you know, outputs of the nerf, as you may know, uh, for the uh, that you can see some of the, the nerf the web page. So here the, the key idea is that we are going to use the volume rendering the equation. And here the assumption is that uh, we are basically uh, assuming some kind of the volume in this 3D space. Uh, that is basically emitting, either emitting or basically absorbing some of the light. Uh, but let's only think about some of the cases that we are just like emitting the, you know, having the volume, which is like emitting the light. Uh, and the, the volume is basically emitting the light at every single the point. So whatever point that you pick uh, inside the volume, we're going to assume that uh, that kind of the point inside the volume is basically somehow like generate some kind of the light. Uh, so that's kind of the uh, information. And the amount of the light that is basically encoded at each point along each of the specific direction uh, will be stored as kind of the radiance map. So we are having this information. And while we are not having any kind of the some surface in this case, uh, we're going to assume that the volume is also kind of the full of some kind of the particles, uh, which means that the rate can basically uh, collide with some kind of the, the particles inside the volume. So how likely the ray will basically collide with any kind of the particle in the volume uh, is basically represented as kind of the density. So we are having another D map, uh, which is the, the density map. So this kind of the two information, the density map, and also the radiance map, uh, these two are basically something that we are going to represent as the implicit functions. And these implicit functions are basically learned using, uh, basically also represent as the neural net. So we are, we are basically having the two neural networks, uh, which are basically describing these two implicit functions. Like one is the radiance map, uh, which is basically, you know, giving the information about like uh, how much of the amount of the radiance that the volume is basically emitting at that specific point and also the, the direction. Uh, so for the radius map, we are taking the two information, uh, the position at the point and also the direction. And we are also basically having this kind of like radius information for each of the RGB, the color channel. So we are basically having the three dimensional vector. And also as kind of the, the density map, we are uh, also uh, you know, uh, having some kind of information about like how likely the ray will hit something uh, at the kind of the point. Uh, which is giving some kind of the density information. So the goal here is basically training a kind of the true neural network, which is giving the radiance map and the density map. And actually, we're going to see that actually you know, these two maps can be represented with a single neural net. So we're going to see also the architecture and basically in a way that we can do some sort of the neural rendering. So here the main question is that let's assume that we are having the both kind, both the radiance map and the density map, the, the density map uh, in this 3D space. And given these two information, how are we gonna make some kind of the rendering the equation? So for today, uh, we are not gonna consider any kind of the complicated the global illumination, but let's only think about the simple the local illumination. So what we are going to do is that uh, when you shoot a ray into some you know, specific direction in this ray space, uh, we're gonna basically see how we can calculate the output the radius uh, given this kind of the density and also the, the, you know, the incoming source will be the, the radiance information. So this is basically the equation that we are seeing. So basically what we can see is that uh, these two are basically uh, the, the neural network. The first one uh, is, in the, is giving the, the density information. And also the second one is giving the, the radiance information, which is basically the, the amount of the light uh, emitted at the specific point and the direction. And based on that, we are taking this kind of integral. Uh, and what we can see is that uh, we are having this kind of the extra term, uh, which is more about the, the transparency. Uh, so here, basically, the transparency is also defined based on the density. So if we take this kind of integral, we are taking the, this transparency information. Then the final, the sort of the output, the radius, uh, is computed as kind of the sum, you know, the sum of the multiplication uh, of the transparency and the density and the radiance information. So we can basically see that this is kind of intro, this kind of multiplication of the three terms. Like the first one is the transparency, and the second one is the density, and the third one is basically the radiance, right? 
So we're gonna see the meaning of like each of them. Uh, so before we get started into some more details, do you have any questions for this equation? So here the key thing is that you no, know, uh, you no know, key questions might be is like what's the meaning of the density here, and also the key thing is that the transparency is also calculated uh, from the based on the, the density. So also you no, know, what's the meaning of like having this equation? So this might be some of the key key questions here, right? So let's you no know, uh, dive into some more the details here. So. What basically what we want to say is that you know, first, what's the exact meaning of the density? So if we see some more the details in terms of like how we exactly define the meaning of the density, uh, let's assume that we are shooting a ray, and basically the ray can be considered as kind of the very thin the cylinder uh, in this 3D space. So let, let's assume that the ray is kind of the very thin cylinder uh, in this 3D space, and we would we'd like to see some kind of the slice, the, the section of this kind of the, the ray, the long cylinder. So let's say this is kind of the, uh, the some kind of the, the slice of the ray, uh, of the, the long cylinder. So we are having this kind of the section, right? Uh, and the, with some kind of infinitesimal the width uh, of the, the, the section of the kind of the, the cylinder, with basically the delta t here. And here basically E, this E uh, denotes uh, the area of the, 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 the section of the, the, the cylinder. So we're having this kind of E, uh, the area of the, the section, and also the infinitesimal, the kind of amount of the time, which is the delta T. And then the basically the volume of this kind of the slice of the ray uh, is now becoming like E times the delta T, right? Makes sense. And basically, we are going to assume that we are having some kind of the some particle of the density information, uh, which is actually rho t here. Uh, and then what you can also see is that uh, you know a is kind of some sort of the constant the amount of the projected uh, the area of the particle. So if we shoot a ray and if we assume that uh, all the, the some kind of the particles uh, look like this, then basically this. Uh, will be basically the area, the project, the area of the projection uh, along this specific direction, right? So just to simplify all these kind of things, uh, we're gonna assume that every single the particle had the same the projected uh, the particle the, the, the area uh, along the along the projection of like this direction, right? So this is basically the density of the particle, and this is about the projected area uh, for each of the single the particle, and this is basically the uh, no, this was basically the volume. Uh, of the section, right? So if you multiply the density and the volume, then that becomes the number of the particles, right? Make sense. And here, basically, what we are going to see is that you no, know, how you know it's all about basically calculating how likely the ray will collide uh, with any of the particles here. Uh, and for that, we are basically going to calculate the ratio of the occluded area. So what we are going to see is that the ratio is basically uh, defined as kind of the uh, area, the sum of the area, the projected the area of the, the particles uh, inside this section, this slice, uh, divided by the, the area of the, the section here, right? So if we basically calculate the sum of the project area uh, for the all the number of the particles and dividing this, this by basically the area of this kind of the, the section here, uh, that will give us the information about like, how likely the ray uh, will hit something uh, inside this section. So actually what we mean by you know, this function is that uh, while people typically call this function as kind of the density function, but it's exactly not about the density. So it's actually about how likely the ray will hit something. So it's more about the probability. Uh, so that's basically, uh, the a times this kind of the ratio. So this is basically all about basically you know calculating this kind of probability about how likely the ray will hit something. Uh, it is kind of the, the slice of the ray, uh, and this is basically actually called uh, the extinction the coefficient or the opacity information. So while you know people just easily use the term for the as kind of the density for this function, uh, the information that actually we want to get. Uh, is basically more about some sort of the probability. So actually, we are having the, this opacity function, uh, which is the giving the information about the probability of like colliding something at this point. 
and you know, given this information, uh, what we are going to calculate is about the transparency. So we didn't see yet like why this you know, transparency is basically defined in this way. Uh, but what we want to you know, see as kind of the transparency is also about the probability, but about basically not colliding anything uh, until we reach that point, until the, the time t. So we are having these two probability terms. Uh, so and in the final equation, what we do is that uh, if we go back to here, uh, we are multiplying this transparency uh, with the opacity, right? So having the multiplication of the transparency and the you know, opacity. So what does the mean of like having the multiplication is that you know, uh, the multiplication of these two is basically giving the probability that the ray will collide something at this point while not having like any kind of collision until that point. Make sense? So when you do the you know, you know, multiplication of the transparency and the opacity, that basically means how likely the ray will fly to that point uh, without any making any collision and then stopping at that point by making the collision at the point. So how the how likely the ray will reach the point uh, without any collision before that. So then you know, we can say that actually this equation uh, it's basically nothing, but it's more about basically sort of like taking the expected value. Uh, so this is more about the, the radiance at the point. Uh, and this is more about basically how likely the ray will basically reach that point. Then we are basically taking the multiplication of these two and taking the sum. So which is basically taking the expected value of the radiance uh, by having all this information. Is this clear? Any question on this? So what we have seen in the deep box of the case is that uh, we did not basically decouple this term into these two things. So now we are having the both the transparency and also the opacity. Uh, but in the deep box of case, uh, these two terms, uh, these two terms uh, was basically just you know, predicted as kind of single the value, the visibility square uh, using the neural net. But now we are representing the same divisibility uh, as kind of some multiplication of these, these two terms. Uh, one is the density and the other one is the transparency. So now let's see, like, you no, know, then, you no. Know, and also the thing is that the transparency is calculated uh, based on the, the opacity that we are having, right? Then how should we basically calculate the transparency? So the by definition of the transparency, which is about the pro the probability or how likely the ray will not hit any kind of things until that point. Uh, if we see the transparency at this time, like the t plus the delta t, uh, the transparency at this point uh, should be a multiplication like these two. So the meaning of like the multiplication like these two is that the ray should not hit anything until time t, right? And this is more about basically how likely the ray will hit something uh, in that you know, specific fraction of the time t. And if we take the one minus like this term, that means that the ray is also not hitting anything in the section, right? So if we basically see some kind of the uh, ray like this, and we are having the delta t here, and until that point, we are having the time t, right? So this means that the ray is basically not hitting until this point, until reaching this point, right? And also multiplying this also means that ray also does not hit anything uh, in this specific you know, uh, this section. Uh, that becomes the transparency uh, until the point of the t plus delta t, right? So we just like simply multiply these two because these two are basically you know, independent of the events. Uh, so we can see that you know, the transparency basically should basically satisfy this kind of condition. And if we just rewrite this into kind of the OD formulation like this, then we can see that actually this becomes kind of the OD formulation and this OD formulation has this solution. So also the kind of initial condition is that at the very beginning, the transparency uh, should be basically one, which means that obviously at the, you know, the starting point, there's no heat, right? So the, the probability of like not hitting anything should be basically one, right? So when you have this kind of like the initial the condition, uh, if we find a function which is like basically satisfying this kind of the constraint, uh, that becomes uh, this exponential form. So this is basically calculate, calculated. Uh, the transparency is basically calculated uh, in this way. 
by just taking the integral form and basically having the exponential form like this uh, using the old past information. Is this clear? Any question on this? Yeah, so you don't need to see how exactly we solve like the ODE, but here the key thing is that you know how exactly the transparency is basically defined. Uh, so the, the by definition of the transparency, uh, the the transparency at the point of the t plus the delta t uh, should be the multiplication of the you know transparency at the time t uh, multiplied by the one minus uh, this stuff, which is basically showing like how likely the rate will hit something in this section. Then the kind of the interesting kind of thing is that now we are taking the exponential of the, the minus of the, this kind of the integral, right? And the sigma term here is basically the probability, which means that it should be non-negative number. So we are taking kind of the accumulation of the non-negative number, which means that if we see only this part, this should be non-decreasing function, right? It should be, it should not, decrease because we are accumulate uh, some kind of the non-negative the, the, the quantity. So since this part is basically the non-decreasing the function, uh, if we see the entire the formulation, the exponential minus of this integral, this whole thing now should be non, uh, you know, non-increasing function, right? So if we see the exponential form here, uh, then we're gonna typically see this kind of the graph. Which means that the transparency should become is now becoming some sort of a non-increasing function, uh, which makes sense, right? So physically, when you really define some sort of the transparency, uh, if we have some kind of trans transparency at some point, so this is more of a, some sort of the visibility, right? So if we have any kind of the probability, like how likely you know we're gonna uh, reach that this point without hitting any kind of things. And if we also see the transparency at the point which is behind this point, then obviously the transparency at the second point should be you know, equal or less than the transparency at this point, right? It cannot be increased physically uh, by definition of the transparency, right? And our formulation of transparency uh, is basically satisfying this kind of the uh, property of the uh, you know, having the non-increasing the function, so which is really aligned with some our the you know, you know, you know the physical concept about the occlusion, uh, which is also making some kind of the major difference with the default kind of the framework. Makes sense. So this is basically the basic idea uh, for the volume rendering the equation. Do you have any questions on this? So again, like the basic idea is that we are basically taking some kind of the expected value, like you know, how likely the ray will stop at the point, and also the incoming sort of the, you know, the emitted the radiance at the point. And this kind of the probability is basically computed as kind of the multiplication of the transparency and also the opacity. The transparency basically indicates like how likely the ray will not collide with anything until that point. And also the sigma here is basically about the opacity, which means like how the, much the ray will hit something at the point. And this transparency is basically calculated based on the opacity, uh, which is basically making the non increasing function, uh, which is naturally basically aligned with the physical concept uh, about the, the occlusion. So this is kind of like the basic idea uh, for the volume and during the equation. Then what we have discussed for the old rate tracing the system is basically you know all about basically how we exactly calculate uh, this kind of integral with some kind of discrete samples, right? So as we also discussed in the Monte Carlo the estimate, uh, what we are going to do is that we are going to do some kind of the sort of the stratified sampling, that's dividing the ray, uh, the, the region of the, the the range of the ray into some kind of the evenly spaced kind of the beans. And we're gonna simplify all the things. So we're basically going to sample like one point uh, for each of the kind of the uh, uniform kind of the, 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 this, the region of this some kind of the beans uh, and doing some kind of the calculation. So let's think about some of the cases that now we are doing some kind of the, some sort of estimate by having some kind of the n number of the regions, some intervals uh, along the way and taking some kind of the one of the samples here. So let's say we are basically having the n time samples and for each of the point uh, that we are taking some kind of the 
you know, opacity information and also the incoming the radiance information. So given this kind of the only information, let's say we are having the n discrete tight the tight samples uh, for the uh, having some kind of the density, so the opacity here and also the radiance information, how we can exactly calculate this kind of the integral from here? Uh, let's take some time to think about some basic idea here. So we can do some kind of the you know, estimate we're doing some kind of the approximation uh, with this kind of the n samples. Uh, what we kind of the best way for this? Yeah, let's think about the Montecal estimate and see how we can do approximation. At the same time, let me first move on, but maybe you can think about some kind of ideas for this. Uh, but this might be kind of the, some basic things that we can come up with, right? Doing some kind of the simplest sort of the Monte Carlo estimate, uh, which is actually the same with the uh, Riemannian sum. Just like, you know, this is basically some sort of the, uh, the basic form of the Monte Carlo estimate that we have seen in the previous lecture, right? Just taking the sum of like all these kind of examples uh, with the kind of the uh, the range of the each of the interval. Uh, so that becomes the final the output. I, I mean, so basically we can calculate uh, the final the output, the radiance in this way. And also this transparency is also another the form of the integral, right? Uh, so at the very beginning, uh, the, the transparency should be just like, uh, so it should be just like the one here. Uh, so this is kind of the, yeah. And the thing is that, uh, for the, all the other the cases, uh, we just we can also basically approximate uh, the integral as kind of the form of the sum like this, right? And this also become the same as like multiplying this kind of the exponential term. Makes sense. I mean, this is the simplest the way that we can calculate uh, you know the integral with some kind of the n discrete number of examples. But actually, we are going to see a slightly the better version of like calculating these things. So we're gonna basically uh you know you know see the same the formulation in slightly different perspective. Uh, in terms of the now we are taking the integral for each of the 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 interval like this. So now we are let's say we're having some kind of the uh n sort of the interval uh with some kind of the ti to the ti plus one uh, for each of the interval, and then we are taking the integral for each interval like this. And taking the sum of this, then how we can basically calculate uh, this integral? Uh, so this is kind of the like one thing. Uh, so so this is kind of the derivation here. So maybe you can just take like one minute and see what's the meaning of this.
Uh, checking like đi có người trên dưới. So this is basically nothing but like we are having the transparency here, uh, which is defined like this. Uh, any kind of some T, uh, which is in the range of the T I T T I plus one. And then we just split uh, this region of the, the interval of the integral gain uh, from the G to Ti to Ti to T. And these parts of the, you know, the transparency uh, just can be calculated as Ti as we defined in the simple dissolution, right? Then it's matter of basically we are having this term. And you know, we can also assume that uh, the opacity is constant in that specific interval. Then this summation, this integral decodes like the simple uh, this form. Then the only thing is that we just need to take the integral uh, of this part. Then what we kind of the difference uh, of like this formulation uh, with the simple is the form. Can you tell the difference with the simple the formulation uh, with this formulation? So basically the major difference of like this formulation with the simple the form is that now we are taking this amount of the transparency. So in the previous the simple the solution, actually we just like ignored uh, this amount of the transparency. Uh, basically, just, uh, basically assuming that the transparency, so if we think about like having some multiple the, the intervals, so when you say this specific interval with the ti to the ti plus one, then the you know for any point in this specific interval, we assume that the transparency is basically the same with the transparency that we are calculating until like this point, right? But now we want to calculate the transparency until like any specific point inside uh, this interval. So this kind of is some sort of the offset uh, point. Uh, the, this region becomes some kind of transparency uh, or like this term, right? From the ti to the t. So for more precise the calculation, we you know additionally incorporate the transparency uh, until you know you know at in this term. And while we are also still assuming that the opacity uh, is basically constant in the specific regions, so this is like giving us like slightly more the precise uh, the equation uh, for the same thing. So when you had the, the simple solution, we basically had the sum of the, like this term. But when you basically incorporate the extra the, the transparency uh, inside the interval, now we are seeing that the same formulation uh, can be converted like this form. So this is like different formulation, uh, which is giving some slightly more like the precise the outputs. So if you see the nerve paper, you can see that you know, they are also using uh, this better solution uh, for this kind of like discretization. So please check out what's the kind of the difference between the simple formulation and the better formulation. Yeah, so as I said, you know, we can see that now this becomes some kind of the term uh, for the probability, like you know, how likely the ray will collide uh, for kind of the, any point uh, inside uh, the, the, you know, the ice the interval over the ray. And then we can see that you know, this should be kind of the, some expected value uh, of the radiance we see here, uh, since the W is kind of the probability. But the thing is that if this was kind of really some kind of the you know, expected value, the thing is that uh, this W should be kind of having some sort of the probability distribution, uh, which means that if we just detect the sum of the all the probability, the sum of the probability should be exactly one, right? That's the definition of the probability distribution. But do we really get such kind of the results? Uh, well, actually sometimes no. Uh, sometimes there would be some cases that the sum of the probability uh, becomes less than one. Then what's the meaning of like having that the sum of the the, uh, the probability becomes like less than one? Obviously, well, that means that there was like no collusion until we pass the entire the range of the ray. Uh, if we are just shooting some kind of the empty space, uh, there should be no collision, and there's nothing that we are basically fetching any kind of the radiance information. So for more precise kind of the computation, all the things what we need to do is that actually we need to define some kind of the background uh, kind of things. Uh, in kind of the with some sort of infinite distance, and we are basically mixing some sort of the background world with some kind of the some you know 
uh, constant kind of the radiance information, uh, and also having some kind of the probability, of like how likely uh, we're gonna basically pass through the all the empty space and hit the basically uh, the in, you know the the background at the infinite uh, the distance. So the final the kind of the uh, the formulation actually can be defined like this, uh, incorporating the final the terms uh, for the background. Then we can really see that uh, this formulation really becomes some sort of the expected value for the radius. Uh, so this could be making more sense, right? So this is basically the only information that are basically you know uh, utilized in the the nerve the pipeline. So since this is not the machine learning course, I'm going to skip some more the details about you know, how we exactly uh, implement these things using some kind of the neural network. And also there are some details in terms of like how we can get some of the better results uh, with some kind of positional the encoding. And you know, also the kind of thing is that you know, in the typical the Monte Carlo estimate, what we also do some sort of important sampling, right? Uh, but we just you know discuss some ideas about the the straight by you know, the the sampling. Then how we can also do some sort of the important sampling. Uh, so for that actually, uh, you know, the NERF the framework is actually utilizing the two networks. Like one is the sort of the core sampling, uh, give me some kind of the rough idea about the probability. Then once we get some kind of the predicted uh, the probability of uh, the point, then now we are using this information for the adaptive sampling and basically do another some sort of the calculation. Uh, in some kind of the more number of the samples. So this is also kind of some technique uh, basically utilizing some other important sampling uh, in the rate, you know, the rendering the pipeline, the volume rendering the pipeline. So the, yeah, so these are some kind of the basic idea in terms of like how we can incorporate the volume rendering the equation uh, in the neural rendering and get some kind of the much better the results. So compared to the deep boxes, you can see that now we can you know, much more the precisely describe all the details for this 3D thing scene. So this was kind of the uh, interesting the outputs. Uh, yeah. But still, yeah, there are lots of the limitations to the learn. So I also recommend you to check out this slide, uh, see and you know how what are the kind of the limitations and how these kind of the limitations were addressed uh, in any kind of these many. Uh, reset work. And next time, what we are also going to discuss is that, so these are all based on the implicit the representation, but we can also consider having some kind of the more like some hybrid version of the representation, combining some more neural things and also some conventional things like the voxels, point clouds, and the mesh and all the things. And uh, especially like, like these days, people are using the Gaussian split representation, uh, which is also based on some split representation. So next time we are going to also going to discuss the some other hybrid representation and especially some kind of the key ideas in the Gaussian split uh, the representations and also in May fifteenth we are also going to invite the author of the Gaussian split and so he will be able to give some more ideas about the Gaussian split as well. Okay, so this was kind of the quick introduction for the NERF and if you also have any other big questions about the NERF and the neural rendering, volume rendering, uh, please let me know and please post questions in Slack. You can also go over the all the questions. Any questions? Okay, thank you and I will see you next Monday. Bye.